This afternoon, Ukraine's president said that Russia would have to carpet bomb the Ukrainian capital and kill its residents if it wanted to take the city. There's continued to be heavy shelling in Mariupol, where the city's deputy mayor pleaded for people to be allowed out and for aid to come in. President Zelensky has demanded the release of Melitopol's mayor, saying that CCTV footage showed him being kidnapped by Russian soldiers. Fighting near Kyiv has intensified, with Russian forces said to be edging closer to the capital. For the first time, President Zelensky put a figure on the number of Ukrainian military personnel who have been killed since the invasion began. 1,300, he said. And a warning, my report does contain some distressing images. The letter Z has lost its innocence. Russia's symbol of war, now a symbol of terror. This is Mariupol, and call this vandalism by heavy armor. What did this block of flats ever do to get shelled? Or this tire repair shop? Mariupol is guilty of not falling to the Russians. But it's easier to destroy buildings than to destroy the spirit of people fighting for their home. These Ukrainian troops are refusing to give up. And the government acknowledged today that they'd lost 1,300 soldiers so far. But the heaviest price, as ever, is paid by those who cannot fight back. And who cannot find refuge in a war in which hospitals are targets. Civilians streamed into a war today that is familiar to anyone who paid attention during the Syrian war. <laughs> Anastasia is inconsolable. She lost one of her children in the shelling. <laughs> What words can do this justice? On the road to Mariupol is Volnavaka, a glimpse of the hell to come. The drone footage is silent, which is just as well, because this is now a dead landscape, rendered lifeless by Russian armor. Tanks parked where there should be cars. Church without spire. Bathtub as a fire pit. To the victors, the spoils. The longer it takes Russia to occupy parts of Ukraine, the more it turns all this uninhabitable. An act of vengeance for a war not going to plan, but by no means lost. This was Russian government footage of troops near Kyiv. One wonders what they've been told with their orders. Is it to wrong the rights of a Russia more sinned against than sinning? Do they really feel like victims of Western aggression? What do they truly think they're fighting for in the unwelcoming fields of Ukraine? Or, for that matter, dying for? We don't know where or how senior Lieutenant Denis Sokolov died during the war that Russia still calls a special military operation. But in the city of Perm, his home, he leaves behind a wife and two children one of them just a few months old. A family who, at this moment, will probably feel the same pain as their Ukrainian counterparts. But they do know what they're fighting for. The Ukrainian citizens of occupied Melitopol converging on the town hall, shouting, bring back our mayor. Here kidnapped by Russian officers who put a bag over his head, Mayor Ivan Fedorov had refused to follow Russian orders and is now missing. It's the kind of rough justice that Ukrainians don't want to live under.
Vladimir Putin may question the right of this nation to exist, but with every shell, he's making the case for them. Their identity is being forged on the anvil of war. And sung by the opera company of Odessa, a city preparing for a siege, a national anthem once unknown outside Ukraine is now ringing in the world's ears. Now, President Zelensky continues to run his besieged and fractured country from the government quarter in Kyiv. He even gave a press conference today and went on a coffee run. And the capital feels the Russian noose tightening around its neck, with troops advancing slowly but relentlessly. When the siege begins in earnest, it may become the most dramatic, bloody and drawn-out siege since World War II. Our international editor, Lindsay Hilsom, has been to Brovary, 20 miles northeast of Kyiv, and is in the capital for us now. Lindsay. Matt, in the last few minutes, we've been hearing the rumble of artillery, probably about 15 or 20 miles away to the northwest, and a small amount of small arms fire as well. Now, there were quite a lot of overnight strikes on the outskirts, including at an airfield and an ammunition depot at a place called Vasil Kiev, which is to the southwest. But what we saw was not like that. That is very much a military target, but we went out to the northeast, as you mentioned, to Brovary, and what we saw that had been hit was a food warehouse. Now, this is very significant. The, um, the Russians have some form in this. When they were working with the Syrians in Syria, they destroyed food in the fields, crops, and also warehouses. So the question is now, what about the coming siege? Are they really trying to make that even harder for civilians? Because civilians in the city, what will they need if the city is surrounded? They'll need heat, they'll need light, they'll need water, and they will need food. And so if they are destroying food, well, that is potentially a war crime. And I think that what we saw today raises many questions about Russian tactics. A Russian missile killed the family in this car on day one of the war. The wreckage is now part of a checkpoint on the road northeast out of Kyiv, next to all the signs of the normal life that they and others used to lead. We drive north past apartment blocks. If the Russians come down this road, maybe snipers will take aim from the windows. We're following the car of a member of the Ukrainian parliament heading towards a pall of smoke, site of a Russian attack in the early hours of this morning. The strike hit a warehouse complex just outside the dormitory town of Brovary. Electronics in one part, foodstuffs in the other. From here, food is taken to Brovary and to Kiev. So they try to cut off for the supply of food to to city. So you don't think this was a stray missile? No, I no no because it was like say, it was also grads, also missiles. So it was like several types of. Uh, so it was targeted. Yeah, it was targeted on this definitely. We saw a similar food warehouse hit in the Black Sea port of Mykolaiv, adding to the suspicion that destroying food is a tactic. A former deputy prosecutor is here to investigate if there's evidence of a war crime. Видно, что артиллерийский удар был направлен на именно на этот объект, а этот объект является одним из самых таких, скажем, крупных складских помещений, где есть холодильники, продукты питания, которые поставляются в столицу Украины, в Киев. И мы можем говорить о том, что это было целенаправленное уничтожение этого объекта для того, чтобы создать гуманитарный коллапс и лишить населения Киева продуктов питания. They think the artillery is being fired from about 10 miles further north. That's the line of defense, and that's the main destination of attack from east, where they try. Because they were stopped here, they started to move on this. You see this round road mm -hmm. yeah, to Borispol, where is yes. the international the airport. airport. Yeah. So that's because they couldn't get here. They started to go here. 
and they now all this place is in Russian forces and but that's the main road. We drive on towards the front line. But at another checkpoint, they say we can go no further. This is the nearest to the front line that the Ukrainian soldiers will let us go. They're quite nervous around here because the Russians aren't far away, maybe five miles or so, maybe even nearer. Just up the road is a column of tanks that the Ukrainians managed to take out the other day. But the Russians have fanned out. They're all around, north, east and west of the city now. In the last eight years, training and weaponry supplied by Western countries have transformed the Ukrainian military. More is coming all the time, but is it enough? When I see that Western representatives are saying we don't want to escalate, so we have a full-scale war here. And if we can, uh, the, our uh, Western allies uh, are helping us and providing us with stingers, with javelins, why can't we, they provide us with aircraft? It's the same. The Stinger can down the aircraft and the fighter can down the aircraft. No difference. We are not asking for boots on the ground. We are not asking for pilots in the skies. We just ask for weapons, uh, uh, aircraft, things like this to help. We head back south towards the city. Still protected, still supplied with food, still sustaining two million people. But for how much longer? Lindsay Hilson reporting. Now, the Russian intelligence service, the FSB, is a successor of the notorious KGB and was headed by one Vladimir Putin in the late 1990s. Its remit is mainly internal, but also covers former Soviet republics, including Ukraine. Reports yesterday said that the most senior officer covering areas outside Russia and his deputy were under house arrest, raising speculation that a blame game might be underway in Moscow. The man who first reported the arrest was Andrei Soldatov, a journalist and an author of a history of the FSB. I interviewed him a short time ago, and I began by asking him to explain the importance of these developments. The FSB is primarily responsible for the situation in Ukraine. And two generals who were arrested and placed under house arrest, they are two people who actually are in charge of this department. So basically it means that Putin became very unhappy with the political intelligence coming from Ukraine. It's not a big secret that the FSB is not just a espionage agency, but they're also in charge of, uh, especially in Ukraine, uh, they are in charge of uh, uh, promoting uh, pro-Kremlin politicians, mm. uh, political parties and groups. And it looks like right now it dawned on Putin that Probably there is no political opposition to the, to the Kiev government right now, and he cannot rely on anyone in Ukraine. So is this a classic case of the underlings, the lieutenants, too afraid to tell the boss, the strongman, Putin, the truth? Absolutely. Uh, and we should remember that uh, Putin is uh, himself uh, as an intelligence officer. So he believes that he is the most informed politician in the world. He always life, uh, well, he always uh, loved to uh, boast of his uh, knowledge of some intimate details of uh, statistics and all that. Uh, but the problem with this kind of politician that it's very difficult to tell him something he doesn't want to hear. And it looks like that's exactly what mm. happened. So he's not happy with the FSB. By all accounts, he's not happy with the army because there were these reports uh, a few days ago of him sacking a few senior generals. Uh, Who is he actually relying on right now? Usually, we had so-called a joint uh, group of forces. And there was always a commander, someone, some general, top-level general, who was uh, in charge of the situation on the battlefield. The most interesting thing now is that we do not have this kind of general right now. We have only people in Moscow uh, talking about how the war should be conducted which means that uh, mm. the, the whole thing about chain of command is, uh, is getting really weird. Is it possible that some of these senior generals, especially the ones who are on the front here, perhaps together with some disgruntled officers in the FSB, could turn against Putin, could try and dislodge him? Obviously, everything now seems to be uh, possible, but we need to remember that uh, Putin is a trained KGB officer. He, he is very well... Uh, he's, uh, he's uh, well aware of uh, 
uh, risks to his personal security and safety. And he has not one, but two security services with only one task to protect his body. Uh, and he, uh, he, sometimes he, he, he claims that actually he survived 12 or 13 attempts on his life. So I think he took precautions and, uh, and he's ready for that. And what do you think he wants out of this and how far is he prepared to take it? Well, the biggest problem of Putin is that his way of getting out of troubles is always to escalate. Is he is a guy who is known to know how to escalate. We got into uh, in Russia got into uh, trouble in Donbas because of Crimea, and we got Crimea because of the Maidan Revolution. It's it's always like that. So my biggest fear that Putin might decide at some moment that his way out now is to escalate again and to try something somewhere else. Like where? Well, they have several countries where you have. Um, some ethnic Russian minorities. I would be extremely worried about Moldova right now. The Baltic right Republics. Now. And the Baltic Republic. And of course, you have uh, the Black Sea and you have lots of uh, NATO uh, warships which might be targeted for some attacks. So there are some ways to escalate uh, and sh stopping short of uh, causing a real uh, war with NATO. But finally, if you briefly, if you are a betting man, do you think he will take this to the next level? I think, unfortunately, right now, it looks like that. I think now he doesn't see any way to de-escalate and get back to, to normal. Uh, mm. I don't think that's actually possible right now. Maybe we need to wait, uh, to wait for some weeks when the sanctions finally hit mm. Russian economy, uh, like it could happen, but not now. Well, that's depressing. Andrzej Soldato, thank you very much. Thank you.